So I decided to uh, start here. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons for this is about 25% of my previous work, publications and so forth, have involved explicitly this element uh, in the form of uh, hydrogen ions. Um, and actually about another 20% um, has involved these elements down here. And the other 55% has involved this series of elements in here in this part of the periodic table and the platinum group elements. Um, another reason for starting here is that since David Hollander is speaking today, I thought that I might induce him to speak for 30 minutes on helium. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to begin with some early fish history. And between, um, there are probably some people out there, maybe one or two, who weren't born when, you know, <laughs> yet. Um, <laughs> whoops. Am I going backwards or forwards? Okay, there we go. Um, in 19, starting in about 1982, uh, Peter and Betzer, Peter Betzer and I um, were conducting investigations in the North Pacific on uh, pteropod dissolution uh, kinetics. And one way to, uh, to quantitatively characterize that is to measure pH because it's involved in this, uh, in this reaction here. Um, in the early work, we used potentiometric measurements on our NOAA cruises. And the USF scientists included uh, Mike Morris, Peter Betzer, and me. And uh, Mike Morris was there um, because he was the top performer in chemical oceanography the year before. And so um, Peter and I managed to talk him into coming on our cruise and doing work that was a lot more chemical than what he was doing for his master's degree. And he was working with Tom Hopkins on, uh, on fish biology. Um, starting in 1985, um, subsequent to many frustrating experiences using <coughs> pH electrodes, uh, we began to develop spectrophotometric procedures for measuring seawater pH. And, and all of these developments then, um, and many to follow, actually come from the uh, University of South Florida, including the, its Center for Ocean Technology. Our first publication, um, the first author, um, was my, uh, my first um, doctoral student and, uh, and included um, Mike Morris, who you'll see a little bit more about in a minute. In uh, 1987, um, we began to utilize these new techniques that we developed in the college for, uh, to investigate dissolution kinetics and also to standardize pH measurements. You're supposed to make buffers in order to calibrate electrodes, for example. But if you make up seawater buffers, which is a special kind of a buffer, it's, um, it's a very exacting process. And you're never convinced that you've done it right. So using the newly developed methods that we had, we could actually measure the buffers and see if they were the buffer that you tried to make up. And this would also apply to other NBS buffers that, that people would, uh, would make up. And one of the things that we saw is that these buffers actually become contaminated with CO2, atmospheric CO2 from the lab through time. And so your buffer doesn't stay constant through time. <clears throat> so from 1989 to the present day, basically from about the 1990s onward, we have developed and we also have utilized pH measurements using spectrophotometric systems um, for measuring pH and also measuring various CO2 system parameters in marine systems and, and also freshwater systems. And in 1989, um, Ocean Optics was founded with Mike Morris as the president and Two others of us, me and uh, Luis Garcia Rubio, um, were obviously from the College of Marine Science. So three quarters of the founding members of Ocean Optics uh, uh, were from the College of Marine Science, then the Department of Marine Science. And um, 
This is one reason I want to recommend to you to study hard in chemical oceanography when you're, uh, when you're taking the course. <laughs> so this is the transition that we made. This is a, um, here you see a um, conventional pH electrode. It's only colored because of, uh, um, because of some iodine substances used in the reference cell in here. So the, the data that you get, it, get from it are monochromatic. You only get voltages when you, when you measure this. And there are real problems in, um, in precision and accuracy when you use this. So we, tr uh, we, um, we transition to color. And these are the kinds of colors that you get when you use spectrophotometric indicators to look at solution pH. So you saw what the eye sees when you see these various colors. This is what a, a spectrophotometer sees. And so these are the data that we're actually looking at when we make pH measurements. Um, what we do actually in practice is we utilize only, th we generally utilize only three wavelengths, one right here at the peak. So we measure absorbances right here. And we also measure absorbances right here. And then we measure out here just as one extra means of looking for baseline changes in the spectrophotometer. Um, if you were to transform this color right here um, in the laser pointer onto this diagram, it would essentially be something like a, a straight line, a straight vertical line that would be a little bit thinner than this line right here. So here's what's going on when we're me measuring spectrophotometric pH measurements. Um, we have two forms. This is a, the basic form. So at high pH, at sufficiently high pH, you would see this spectrum. At sufficiently low pH, you would see this spectrum. For intermediate pHs, you would see a combination of these. And so we are looking at this equilibrium right here. We're looking at the transition from this form, the HI form, to the basic form, I2 minus. Uh, we do it spectrophotometrically. And pH, which is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, is given by this expression. So one of the things that we have to do, oh, and this R value right here, and this is what the user measures when you're making a measurement. You measure this R value, and it's simply the ratio of the absorbance at this wavelength to the ratio of the absorbance at that, at that wavelength, the shorter wavelength. But what you have to do to do this truly quantitatively, if you want to do this, um, you have to measure um, molar absorbance ratios. So these are some constants, some physical chemical constants that you have to measure with not only great precision, but these also have to be very accurate if you're going to have linear pH behavior. And then we measure um, this uh, equilibrium constant, K2. And it's in general a formidable un undertaking because uh, this has to be done as a function of temperature. Um, for all the temperatures, the whole range of temperatures in the ocean, the range of salinities, ideally, and also the range of pressures encountered in the ocean. And this really takes time and a lot of work. This work um, we've done in the past, as you'll see some of this, but it's ongoing work as well. So this is one of the reasons why we are doing what we're doing. This um, figure shows you how the, the ratio of carbonate to bicarbonate is changing in the oceans today. You can see uh, already between about the time that we started this work and, and the present day that the ratio has really declined astonishingly. Um, and as all of you know, I'm sure, this is bad news for calcareous organisms. And to measure this really precisely, um, spectrophotometric pHs are, are measured. And, uh, th and this is what's done at the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series. These um, dyes and these procedures that we develop for these pH measurements are used for uh, uh, here and, uh, and I think are beginning to be used here in Bermuda now. So this is an average, this line, of what's happening in at, at the 
Bermuda time series station and also the Hawaiian time series station. So this is a global phenomenon. Really, it's, it's rather astonishing to see a figure like this that tells you basically what's going on in the whole of, of the uh, Earth's surface oceans. Um, back in about 1991, we conducted a survey um, between Hawaii and Kodiak, Alaska. And this shows the results of the survey um, all the way from about less than 25 north up to more than 55 north. Each one of these little dots is a manual pH measurement that we made. So we did this in 1991. And, and we did this in 2006, and I'm actually showing you the result that we got in 2006. If you looked at the previous result, you wouldn't really see anything that looked any different from this to the, to the, to the eye. But the measurements are so precise that you can actually take differences of those measurements and, and plot them. And so this is the measured pH difference, the delta pH measured. And, and you can see that pretty much all of the changes are, are confined to the upper 600 meters. Um, part of these changes are attributable to natural processes, uh, differences in, in, in um, oxygen levels and alkalinity due to respiration and water masses moving in different places. And so you can deconvolve this and look at the part that's actually due to anthropogenic. So this is, this is what's happened between 1991 and 2006 in the North Pacific Ocean due to anthropogenic CO2, a whole ocean basin. And in the upper, um, in the uh, wind mix layer, the change per year when you calculate it is 0 0.0017. And so you start multiplying that by the number of years and these changes are just really building. So as time goes on, we'll be able to see these differences even more clearly when we go back and reoccupy these stations. And uh, we are doing that as well for other places in the world. We go out, on, especially on NOAA cruises, and make uh, pH maps and, and also measure other CO2 system parameters. And then we can see in time series what's happening in a, in a manner like this. Um, one of the things we're doing is we're automating our, our, all of our measurements. Um, so it's very laborious to do these things by hand, and so we develop instrumentation to do this. And this is uh, three level, uh, three um, uh, successive um, generations of our of our C's instrument, and uh, and Jim, is that you there? I think. Okay. <laughs> This is um, what we got when we, uh, the data that we got when we took the C's one instrument that Jim was standing um, next to, and we put it in the Hillsborough River. And um, one of the things you can see is here's the instruments doing the work, and, and we're getting one measurement a second. So it um, really removes a great burden from the, uh, from the oceanographers. One of the most interesting things about this to me is, uh, first of all, you can see that the diurnal changes due to the cycles of photosynthesis and respiration. But when I saw this, what I thought was really neat is this little thing right here. So you see that when we had an overcast, less sun on the water, got a little dip in the, in the temperature, and at the same time, the uh, level of photosynthesis drops and respiration starts becoming dominant and, uh, and the pH goes down. So you can even see nuances like that with these techniques. So very, very helpful for um, geochemists. This is some work that we did um, out in the Gulf of Mexico. Sherwood Liu got, did, um, got these data. So you can see that we can measure um, profiles with a very high degree of, uh, of precision in the water column. This was our Cs one instrument that would only go to about uh, 200 meters. And now we can go a lot deeper than that. Here's our, our, our Cs two instrument right here. Um, and and this work with Cs2 is uh, conducted in conjunction with SRI St. Petersburg, our neighbors um, to the east. And here, uh, with this instrument, we can go down to about 800 meters or so. And uh, you'll see later that we're going um, ever deeper. But again, um, 
what's notable about this especially is that we have a vertical resolution of pH of, of one meter, approximately one meter. And with some of this instrumentation, um, I'm not going to talk about this today, but we also measure nutrients and, and other sorts of things, and we can get similar um, resolution in the, in the water column for other chemicals, including some trace metals even in some cases. So this is the um, indicator that we first started working with, um, M. Cresol purple. Um, I, I, I was sort of amazed that my um, one of my most recent graduates um, um, had the same initials as MCP, you know, Mark, Mark Patsavis. And I thought, what are the chances of something like that? Um, uh, so we've, de we've determined this as a function of temperature. We've determined these characteristics as a function of temperature, pressure, and salinity. Uh, we have done this over a range of temperature and salinity. This has been done um, over a range of um, temperatures and salinities, but not pressures yet. And we are using some of these other indicators for CO2 system measurements, to measure total dissolved inorganic carbon, to measure PCO2, and so forth. So there's a lot of ongoing work in these areas, but you can see that we can cover um, any pH that you would certainly encounter ever in seawater, even if you um, acidified it. One of the things that we discovered is there, were, there are impurity issues, especially for some indicators. So here's one for MCP, and this is the real stuff right here. You see, that's really dark and dense. That's the pure stuff. These are impurities that screw up your spectrophotometric measurements. So we had to develop techniques to take out these impurities so we're getting pure measurements with a pure thing. And this really should be done with all of the indicators, but it seems that thymol blue, at least, is a pretty, uh, a pretty pure indicator to start. So these different indicators have different levels of problems, and the problems vary um, as a function of where you you know, where you buy your indicator, even what batch of indicator it was for a given, a given company. So uh, this, this requires a lot, of, a lot of work, and we're right now the number one world vendor for purified MCP. <coughs> and, and Katie Douglas is in charge of that for the most part. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we did is, in conjunction with our instrumental develop, developments, is begin, is begin to use these um, um, devices called liquid core waveguides. These have an index of a fraction of less than water, about 1.29. And what that means is, if you launch light down the inside of this waveguide, and I, and I want to emphasize that this is a much expanded view. The outer diameter of these waveguides can be on the order of a half of a millimeter. So think, that's, that's thinner than the average pencil lead that you use in your mechanical um, pencils. And yet, it has an inner core. It's hollow in the middle. So if you fill this inner core with water and launch light down the uh, waveguide, you have to total internal reflection. So it bounces off the walls and doesn't leave the system. And you can even coil these devices. And so we've used lengths as long as 10 meters um, <laughs> to measure iron in seawater. Um, but I'll, I'll stick with H plus here. So the, the nice, uh, another very important and useful property that these liquid core waveguides have, made of Teflon AF2400, is that they're highly CO2 permeable. And because the inner volume is so small with an ID of, of, of 400 microns, they equilibrate very quickly. And so we can use these to make other types of CO2 system measurements than just pH. And, and as one example here, if you fill up the inside of one of these waveguides with an artificial solution that you make up yourself, you can know what the total alkalinity is of that inner solution in the waveguide. Then you equilibrate it with an outer solution that can be, for example, acidified seawater. So then all of the carbon in the acidified seawater is in the form of CO2. That equilibrates with the inside, and we have an indicator on the inside as well. For those of you who, are, who have already taken chemical oceanography, you know that if you know any two parameters, you can calculate all parameters. And so we make, after the equilibration, a pH measurement. We know what the TA is, and we can calculate what the total carbon is in the natural seawater sample before and after it was acidified. 
And this shows a schematic of just what I'm talking about here. So, uh, oops. Um, fiber optics um, coming in and out of the system. Um, one taking light in, the other taking light to the spectrophotometer. This is the liquid core waveguide. This is our alkalinity indicator solution, which we can replenish from time to time. This is the um, outer solution, which can be seawater that we acidify for in determinations of dissolved inorganic carbon. And again, we're using the same equations here. Um, um, pH is measured um, by measuring um, these um, absorbance ratios, and we have to carefully, and now for a different indicator than I told you about before, we have to measure these, these molar um, abs uh, absorptivity ratios, new equilibrium constants, and we have to know these as a, you know, for the solutions that we're going to be uh, measuring. So this is, again, an ongoing process to, um, to characterize the indicators for all conditions that we need. So um, here is actually the very simple equation for determination of total dissolved inorganic carbon. And all of these constants are well characterized. All of this is well characterized. Again, we're measuring R. And this B sub T term is dependent upon the alkalinity that we put into the indicator, uh, into the inner uh, part of the liquid core waveguide, and, um, and also dependent upon a ratio of some um, equilibrium constants. And so, and one of the really nice things about this is because this term is a ratio of equilibrium constants, it only has a very small dependence on, on temperature. So we can take these devices and over any temperature we might encounter in the environment, uh, we can make DIC measurements. Uh, this shows you another view of, of um, CS2 and uh, th this work is being done ongoing uh, with SRI St. Petersburg and this just shows you that you can actually put one of these into a rosette and you can measure pH in real time. You can have the information brought up on deck and be watching pH at the same time you're watching oxygen, uh, salinity, temperature, and so forth. This is some work that we did uh, in Baybor Harbor with a couple of these uh, seas um, instruments. And so we measured pH. We measured DIC at the same time. pH we can measure once per second. DIC, the equilibration process, takes about